of uh, Punisher Craig Kravitz, one of the uh, biggest hits in Canadian history. Um, good evening. Welcome and thank you all for coming to see my film tonight. This is one of my favorite, the two films that we've screened tonight is you know, two of my favorites. I want to spend, extend a special thanks to Adrian Villeneuve with the Cinema Family for his generosity in screening them. In 1957, Mordecai Richler and I shared a flat in London. He was writing novels, I was directing for British television. Now we were 26 and dreaming. He to be the great Canadian novelist, I to be the great Canadian film director. When he finished writing The Apprenticeship of Dirty Kravitz, he gave me the manuscript and asked me to read it and tell him what I thought of it. Well, I did read it and I told him it was a marvelous novel, certainly the finest Canadian novel, and one day I was going to go back to Canada and make a film of it. He laughed at the absurdity of such a notion. There was no Canadian film industry whatsoever then. But for the next 14 years, it was always in the back of my mind. I tried in the 60s to get financing for it, but it had a few strikes against it. First of all, it had a Jewish protagonist. And as you know, Hollywood was always very reluctant to deal with Jewish characters in their films. Secondly, it was a period picture, period piece, late 40s, early 50s. And lastly, it was set in Montreal. In 1966, Sam Arkoff, head of American International Pictures, was interested, but he wanted to make Duddy a Greek. I said, no. He also wanted to bring it up to date. And I said, Sam, these people don't exist anymore. They would be entirely different today. He insisted. I said, no. Another producer suggested moving it to Pittsburgh. <laughs> Montreal was far, far too parochial, he said to me. Pittsburgh isn't parochial? I said, look, Duddy lives in a Jewish enclave surrounded by a large Catholic city. It's part of his problem. And I told him, for example, that when Mordecai was a kid, French Canadian boys used to come around dance around him chanting, you kill Jesus Christ, you kill Jesus Christ. So that was the world. And you can't move it to Pittsburgh where there is a whole different polyglot. Never mind, you understand. He insisted. I said, no. Finally, around 1970, the Canadian government set up an organization to subsidize Canadian films. And we, uh, it was called the Canadian Film Development Corporation. And I got 70% of my money from them to make this film. So it was then possible for me to adapt Mordecai, my friend Mordecai's novel without violating it. Fourteen years of dreaming, and finally it became a reality. The casting of Duddy was very problematical for me. Duddy does some pretty horrendous things. I needed an actor who could make him understand what was driving him and always engage your sympathies. And he's, after all, he's the whole film. He has to carry it on his shoulders. I looked all over Canada and New York. Finally, I was desperate. Only seven weeks before shooting, we didn't have our leading man. I phoned one of the greatest casting directors in the history of Hollywood, Lynn Stolmaster. I had worked with him in the past. I said, Lynn, I have no money to pay your fee. My budget was $750,000. Canadian. <laughs> I need you to cast my lead. He says, don't worry about the money, Ted. Just, just, just FedEx, FedEx me the script. And two hours after receiving it, he phoned me and said, Ted, not only is this the best script I've read in years, but there's an actor who was born to play Daddy. You won't have heard of him. His name is Richard Dreyfus." You're right, I said, I haven't heard of him. Uh, is there anything I can see? Yeah, he says he was in, a, he was in Dillinger. John Milley says Dillinger, remember that film? Anyway, he was in Dillinger. He plays for four minutes, Babyface Nelson. But I wouldn't go see it, Ted, if I were you. <laughs> Why? Well, he overacts. <laughs> Lynn, you want me to cast someone for Duddy who overacts? <laughs> so, Ted, look, just come down to LA. I'll bring in the best 10 young actors in this town. I'll bet you you'll end up with, Duddy, with Richard Dufus. Well, Richard comes in. And, you know, I had, after all, 14 years, right? I saw Dirty Kravitz, I saw him so clearly. 
as a Polish Russian Jew with brown eyes, dark hair like me. Well, it used to be. And, um, and in, in walks Richard. Richard's a German Jew. He's got blue eyes and gray hair. So this didn't fit my image at all. But then as soon as he started reading the material, it was electric. It was amazing reading. And um, so I cast him. So this, is his, so this was Richard Drivers' first starring part. It's an amazing performance, and I hope that you agree with me. Um, after the screening, there'll be a Q&A. I hope you'll stay for it. What, what made it? I mean, it, so many of your films, uh, your witnesses and aliens, end up being kind of portraits of societies or groups of people. Like, uh, you do a lot of social satires. You do a lot of, and this definitely sort of comes out of, obviously, Jewish culture, but other things. And you said uh, when in the pre-show, for some people who came in late, that the film had to be made in Montreal. Um, what, what about the story that maybe for those of us who aren't from Canada would say, like, makes this particularly Canadian? And not just like, you know, the story of a Jewish immigrant in New York or Chicago or something. What, what kind of details of it that were... Well, that's a good question. Other people can answer better than I can. <laughs> uh, I think that, uh, well, I say, first of all, it's Montreal, as I say, is a big Catholic city. Mm -hmm. and it, the Jewish communities all concentrated on St. Urban Street, at least the working class areas. The West Mount was where the rich, rich Jewish people lived. Um, that place, Walensky, still exists, yeah. where they, <clears throat> at the end, where he's charging up things. Uh, it was a very famous institution where you could get specials, which were pastrami sandwiches with cheese, and I think there were other things that are, I forgot how they made them, but they were delicious, you know, toasted. But um, it was a it was a very intense. Uh, I mean, it, it's it's all gone now. It's been taken over. It's probably disappeared. Um, the Portuguese have moved into the old Jewish area, and the extraordinary architecture, all those steps going up and everything, you know, was a curious. Um, but um, it's it's when when the when the separate when the separatist movement started. Um, all the Anglos left Montreal. Guess who were the only people who didn't leave? Who spoke English? The Jews. They didn't leave. They were not going to be driven out. <laughs> so it's so it's really boiled. Montreal now is strictly uh, French Canadians and uh, a few Anglophone Jews. Wow. Well, you know, the thing that struck me the most of all too is uh, I, I I love the scene with the uncle when he sort of says he, it's almost self-referential where he says something like uh, in books they never want to talk about characters like me or they are mm -hmm. never sympathetic and the if the impetus to make the entire film about that character would normally be the villain and find some sympathy in him. Um, you know, what, did you ever talk with Mordecai early on about like where he drew the character of Duddy or why he sympathized so much with you know somebody that's normally sort of seen as the villain? The, the capitalist or the, you know, the, the, the but pusher. You know, both Mordecai and I suffered a great deal of opprobrium. We lost friends. People accuse us of being anti-Semitic. Um, there's the director, Arthur Hiller. Do you know Arthur Hiller? He's a Canadian director who did Love Story and others. He came up to me and he said, Ted, how could you? How could you? He wouldn't speak, didn't speak to me for what, five years. And Mordecai was accused of being anti-Semitic. And, uh, so um, that's incredible because to me it feels almost in a weird way like a defense of yeah. a certain like it comes I agree. across you know like you like here here's these behaviors that maybe did exist but you, by the end of the movie you can really see on some level where he was coming from or why. Like, Do you understand this was his only route to identity? Yeah. He, yeah. And even though it's almost like he doesn't quite know what's driving him himself. No. Yeah. Oh, uh, one good question I I always forget to ask really early on but when you haven't seen the movie I, you haven't seen this for many years. No. So, what did it, what memories sprung up as you watched it? Oh, there's all sorts of memories. Uh, one of the, one of the one was the lake, um, because I felt that when Duty sees that lake, it ain't merely greed of possession that he wanted to possess. Yes, he wanted to possess it. At the same time, he was having a major aesthetic reaction to it. It was so beautiful. He wanted it because of its beauty, and not merely because it was going to be part of his road to uh, identity and wealth. And so it had to be a very special lake. And I had a wonderful woman who was a location manager. And she, uh, um, she kept offering up lakes. 
She saw 450 lakes. I saw 125 lakes of those 450. I keep saying, no, no, that's not it. No. And the producer, a week before shooting, we still haven't found that lake, and the producer was going crazy. And he said to me, Ted, Ted, Ted what, what, what is this for the lake? One lake is like another lake. And I said, wrong, John. One lake is not like another lake, because this has to be the ultimate lake. This has to be the platonic lake. This has to be the lake of lakes. Ted, you're totally crazy. And so I said, and uh, so finally, she came to me one day, and she said, Ted, I think I found the lake. If this is not it, I'm committing suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so we went, we went out, we tramped across the fields. It was hidden, that was the whole point. No, no, no one knew it was, there were no buildings on it, there was no how to, anyway, we were trapped through, just like that, we ran across these fields and I came to this barrier of bushes and trees and I opened it up. Okay, that's it. Let's go back to the office. Go back to the office? Yes, that's it. That's it. We got it. Let's go back to the office. Come back, you bastard! 450, give me some satisfaction! <laughs> I said, we haven't got time for satisfaction. We've got to get back. We've got to start shooting in a week. And it was, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you, I think you probably responded to that lake the way I did. It was an amazingly beautiful lake. It was owned by two Austrians. An Austrian couple who believed in work through joy or joy through work, I don't know what they believe, but they wouldn't allow anybody to build on their property. Um, and, and I had to be very careful that he was going to kick us out if we did anything. For one day, there was a huge drift log, and it was in the way of my shots. So I said, move this drift log, about six feet this way. He came, and then he came in the afternoon, he said, you move that drift log six feet away. <laughs> he saw it, he knew every detail of that lake. He didn't want to, he didn't want to just spoil it. And there was only one cottage built on it, and it had to be built 50 feet back from the shoreline. But there it was, it was a stunningly beautiful lake. But when I saw it, I remembered, remembered all the going from one lake to another. And uh, does anybody in the audience have a question for Mr. Koch about Dudley Kravitz? No, the question I was just going to say, it's really neat that you, in fact, have the, the, the Dudley discovered the lake the same way you did. She, she says it's interesting that you. That it's interesting that he discovered the lake, that you ended up discovering it the same way he did. In fact, I was actually wondering, did you see it from the same angle when you were like yes. the camera? Yes, I shot it. That first shot was exactly the one I saw it in that angle. It's it's also interesting how he, you know those, those there's so so many subtle moments you have to get just right with like her hand coming off the shoulder. Where does Duddy even know that he's having an aesthetic reaction? Like he's so driven by the idea of what he thinks he wants. You know, um, do you think? The producer said to me, said to me, uh, I said to him, when he was nagging me about the lake, because we hadn't found it, I said to him, um, what do you think a film is, John? He said, what do you mean? I said, you know what a film is? Film is interiors, exteriors, and people standing in front of them. That's what a, that's what a film is, and everyone's got to be perfect. This, this movie, I think you've really got everybody just about perfect. <laughs> but I thought, uh, funny, Joe Wiseman, who played his uncle, just died. He died about two weeks ago. Uh, Jack Warden, who played his father, what a wonderful performance he gave, too. He was a wonderful actor, Jack Warden. Lovely man. He would disappear when we were shooting up on, on the lakes. He would disappear for a week into Montreal with uh, two giant mud wrestlers. Women, I mean. <laughs> he was crazy. Um, <laughs> but all the actors were just wonderful. What was, uh, what was Mordecai Rickler like? I know you had a very it's close Richler, relationship. Right. What? It's Richler. Mordecai Richler. I'm oh, sorry, Richler. It's okay. Right. Uh, well, I know you had a very close relationship with you. He continued to do script work with you. Several with Joshua then and now. Like, what, how did you, uh, did you have like long conversations about Duddy or like in the night or were you? No. Like, well, the incredible thing was I used to say to people, Mordecai was my best friend for 44 years. Uh, I say to people, when they ask me that question, I say, I don't have to use words to talk to Mordecai. He doesn't have to use words to talk to me. And we could finish each other's sentences. We were always on the same wavelength all the time. Um, we rarely discuss, discuss character. Did you guys have similar backgrounds at all? Or? Yes, very similar. Uh, we had dopey fathers, both of us. 
Um, his father was great. I loved his father. <laughs> his father was the ultimate kind of loser, just like this guy was. Uh, one day he said to me, I was, I was with him in the kitchen, and he made me some tea, and he was looking at the, reading the stock pages. And he said, oh, look, Ted, look. Oh, this stock I bought has gone from 50 cents to 90 cents. Oh, I said, oh, that's great, Mr. Richler. Yeah, only one thing, I bought it at $10. <laughs> that was, that was, my father was, that's what my father would do, the same thing. They were, <laughs> there was kind of a naivete about them, which was charming. Um, but, you know, we had very similar backgrounds. That's, I think that's why when we first saw each other, we met. Um, he, he wrote me that for a horse of the same color. Was, was, was when he had, and we came, <clears throat> we met in the south of France. Um, I went down there and he was uh, working on a, on a book. And um, we met, we immediately liked each other. And uh, then we came to, and he said, if, why don't we share a flat if you come to London, which we did. So we shared a flat for about three or four years. Uh, and, um, but we were very, very close. And uh, as I say, we didn't have to use words. We talked. We already talked. I mean, we did talk about the script, but um, he trusted me implicitly. You know, and were and I always understood what he meant by a scene. You know. Were there any changes from the novel, or were there, I mean, what, no? no? I think this, it follows the structure very well. Um, the I, I mean, I adapted the book first. I laid down the structure, and I followed the book very carefully. And uh, Ben Mordecai, that I worked with another writer, another Montreal Jewish writer, Lionel Chetwind, and um, his dialogue wasn't great. So Mordecai, Mordecai didn't want to, didn't want to be involved in it because it. He wrote the book when we were together and finished it in 1959, and this was now now 1973, and he was very superstitious about. He felt that if he worked on the novel, he worked on the, on the screenplay of that novel, it would take him back to a, f a state of mind, a state of creativity that was 14 years ago, and it would interfere with his present novel. And so, but finally I persuaded, I said, look, Mordecai, you've got to come and write the dialogue, only you know how these people talk. And he did come in, he did all the dialogue from beginning to end. But, but uh, well, we did. We did another picture together called. Was, was this, uh, it was called Joshua Lennon now. Or James, James Woods was in it. Um, That's true. Yeah. But, so uh, I guess my question is, how how stylized did you see the film relative to like just absorbing Australian culture, or how much was it a particular kind of vision? It's a huge, it's a big world that you were trying to create. Yeah, I was in a kind of curious frame of mind when I made that film. I was in a deep oh, bed. <laughs> I was despairing of life and human beings and everything, and I think that despair manifested itself in, I think, in the, in the film. I mean, it's, uh, I mentioned earlier about the connection with I know, people who saw the first film. The two characters, neither one of them know anything about themselves. And it was about, maybe it was a reflection of myself, because I knew nothing about myself at that time, but there were people who were driven to doing all sorts of things. Uh, they never knew they were capable of. And uh, the whole metaphor of the light being shining in his face all the time. And because it was light going into the dark, dark underbelly, the dark side of his makeup. Um, so yes, there's, there's plenty of metaphors in it. Uh, and always waking up to the blinding sun with the yes, hangover. Yes, blinding or sun too all the time, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't, I, how much did you, uh, in terms of being an outsider coming to this environment, like how much feedback were you getting from the Australian crew or actors? Well, it, it was, um, I spent a lot of time, about two or three months in the outback, going to the pubs and everything. This, the town of Broken Hill where I shot, it was a totally male town. Men outnumber the women three to one. And uh, if, you know, if you want to find out about a town, I recommend this. You, if you're doing research, uh, take the editor of the local newspaper out to dinner. He knows where all the bodies are buried. <laughs> he knows all about it. And uh, I was saying to him, you know, there's no women. You know, and he says, yeah, the men don't number the women three to one. I said, well, but there's no brothels, are there? There must be brothels. No, there's no brothels. I said, well, what do they do? I mean, what do they do for human contact? He says, they fight. 
And that was the, one of the things, it's, it's a kind of homoerotic quality. In it. The police is not homosexual, so there's a homosexual rape by the doctor. But there's a kind of a homoerotic quality of the fighting. And uh, they always wanted to fight me. Um, <laughs> because it was 1970 and I looked like a 60s hippie radical. And I, my hair was down to here. I had a handlebar mustache. <laughs> I remember the... Um, the very first time, you know that pub that has um, the big beer bottle on the top of it? Yeah, right, the yeah, guy yeah, across yeah. there? Well, that's a real pub. And uh, I, I had, we had to find it. And I saw it where I said, oh, look at that pub over there. We're in the middle of nowhere. Perfect. Let's go there. So we drive across, across this great. You just go off the road. Boom, 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 right across the outback. And we arrived at the place. And there were 30 or 40 cars surrounding it. It was a Sunday. And... Uh, each car had a woman in it with a beehive hairdo. They were not, because women are not, women are not allowed to go into the pubs. In fact, they're not allowed to go anywhere. And uh, the suicide rate is very high in Australia, and the plan of broken hill, it's five times the national average. Women just gas themselves regularly, put their heads in the oven, can't take it. Anyway, so there they were. <laughs> 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 Each in their cars, there's 110 in the shade, no shade. And uh, so I said to the location manager, try let's, let's go inside. I guess it's perfect, it's great, let's go inside, see what the inside is like. And um, he said, Ted, let's come back tomorrow when they're down the opal mines and the zinc mines and the sheep ranches. We'll come back tomorrow. I said, What? 30 miles from Broken Hill. Come on, let's go down, we're here, we're doing. He says, Look, 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 Ted, they don't like outside, it's very much around here especially outsiders that look like you. And I said, what? They're going to hit charming old Ted Kotcheff? Come on, they're not going to hit me. And um, he said, uh, okay, if you want to go in, you go, I'm not going with you. It's your funeral. It's, it's your funeral. And, and, and I got out of the car and I thought, wait a minute, John Curry's built like a brick shithouse. He was a rugby player. And he's scared to go in? What are you doing in there, Kotcheff? You're nuts. Anyway, but that was not to be deterred. It was too late. So I walked in this place, and 40 pairs of drunken eyes kind of looked at me. The whole place quieted down, it was like a western. Anyway, I walked over, and I said, I'll have a schooner of ale, please. And I started drinking, there's a guy about five feet away from me. And he kind of looked at my hair. Shit. He kind of looked, at my, looked at my mustache. Shit. <laughs> Finally, he leaned into me and he said, Hello, Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't say anything, I kind of kept drinking. And he said, I, he said in, a, in a loud enough voice to quiet the whole room down, I said, Hello, Stalin. To which the response that he, he wanted me to make was, Who the fuck you call me, Stalin? Biff! Yeah, that's what he... And he stuck his jaw way out. I looked at him, I thought, why isn't he hitting me? Anyway, he said, so I, I said to him after a pause, I said, listen, I, I'd love to talk to you, but I'm dead. He didn't get it for two or three seconds. Then he, he said, I love a bloke with a sense of humor. Give this guy a schooner of ale. <laughs> and those guys, from that, they wouldn't let me pay. And I drank all afternoon with them. I didn't invite John outside, no guts, no glory, he can cook out the car. You want to come in with me? And those guys, there's a curious mateship, they became my friends, and they looked after me. I was doing all my research, going around pubs at night, and there was always some guy who wanted to fight me. Come on, let's fight. I said, look, mate, I'm not, I got no quarrel with you, I'm not looking for one. Oh yes, come on, let's fight. And I quickly realized, they didn't want me to hit them. Oh, sorry. They didn't want to hit me, they wanted me to hit them. Then I realized the fighting was a form of human contact. You know, if you can't touch, get touched any other way, you get touched by being hit. And I was just curious. Anyway, they became my friends. And I'd go into pubs sometimes. I said, come on, let's fight. And, so it, and then somebody would say, hey, Bert, leave Ted alone. He's my mate. It was one of these guys from what I should call the Stalin pub. And everywhere I went, it was one of these guys, I don't know how they following me, I don't know why. They always looked after me to make sure I didn't get hurt. So a lot time. of that insistent hospitality was yes. true.
Dar vreau să 